Live from Quito, Ecuador. I'm Sweeney Gray and this is From the South, the evening news brief from Tell Us Your English. We start this new edition right now. For the 25th year running, the United Nations General Assembly has expressed almost unanimous opposition to the United States' economic blockade of Cuba. 191 countries voted against. Only the United States and Israel voted for. One after another, representatives of the African group of countries, the G77 plus China, the Non-Aligned Movement, the ASEAN group of Southeast Asian nations, and CARICOM, all condemned the blockade, which Cuba says has costed $822 billion in the last 55 years. The blockade is contrary to international law. Its aggressive extraterritorial implementation harms the sovereignty of all states. It also damages economic and business interests uh, throughout the world. Mr. President, the U.S. Ambassador failed to mention that the blockade is a flagrant, massive, and systematic violation of the human rights of all Cubans, men and women. It under the Convention uh, for the uh, Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of 1948 uh, can be defined as an act of genocide. It is an obstacle to the international humanitarian cooperation that Cuba offers to 81 countries in the South. The human damage caused by the implementation of this policy is incalculable. Speaking for the 15 Caribbean nations of CARICOM, the representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines said the blockade hurts not only Cuba, but the entire Caribbean region. The member states of CARICOM have maintained close relations with Cuba throughout the years of their independence, and this relationship has been strengthened through a wide range of programs of cooperation in areas including trade, healthcare, infrastructure, and resource human resource development. In 2015, the international community adopted the 2030 Agenda, which sets goals to guide the creation of the future we want, and which aims at leaving no one behind. Our future re regional development is, in many ways, reliant upon our collective advancement and progress. This blockade works contrarily to these aspirations to achieve the sustainable development goals. Striving for peace and the right to development have been the deepest concerns of each member of our Caribbean community since gaining independence. In this, con in this context, we view the embargo not just as a punitive act against Cuba, but as an impediment to our shared regional development. Venezuela's president congratulated Cuba on the result of the vote at the UN. Nicolas Maduro tweeted, Great victory at the UN, for Cuba at the UN. 191 governments and people say, No more blockade. Venezuela will always be with Cuba. Long live our great Latin America. And our correspondent in Havana, Laura Prada, has more on the vote in favor of Cuba. Hello, yes, just a few moments ago, the Foreign Minister of Cuba, Bruno Rodriguez, called for the immediate end of the U.S. blockade to Cuba. In this uh, votation that took place, he called for the, the unconditional end of the U.S. blockade to the island, and he said that Cuba will never accept pressures or impositions from anyone. It has never worked and never will. This is the, major, the main obstacle for the economic development of the island and is a massive and, in, and a sensitive violation of the human rights of the people of this okay. island. This is all I have for now. I get back to you. 
Away from the United Nations, the Netherlands has said its trade with Cuba increased by 11% last year as the Caribbean country approaches its foreign investment goals despite the U.S. blockade. This was announced during the Havana 36th Fifth International Fair. The island received more than $2,000 million in foreign investment despite the Trump administration tightening the blockade that actually went in, into effect in 1962. This is helping Cuba develop tourism, construction, mining, and renewable energies. And from the Dutch government, we are investing in the relationship with uh, Cuba, the economic relationship between Cuba and the Netherlands. And we see in terms of trade that we, our trade is growing for 11% last year. The Foreign Minister of Venezuela, Jorge Ariasa, has been meeting his counterpart in Trinidad and Tobago, Dennis Moses. The broad agenda of the meeting included commercial agreements, security and border issues, as well as energy cooperation. The two foreign ministers, along with other representatives from the region, also discussed ways to strengthen an environment of peace and dialogue after the U.S. imposed sanctions on Venezuela. National preparatory meeting today. What we are really doing here is to prepare for the ministerial. So we discussed some of the documents that would be going to the ministerial in March in Venezuela, in Margarita. And we um, spoke about a number of different issues with regard to our budget, with regard to how we revitalize our organization, with regard to the priorities of the organization, with regard to how we develop our staff and our people, with regard to how we engage in culture to meet the people on the ground. So these were some of our main discussions in the meeting. We also discussed um, a declaration of solidarity for all of those countries in our ACS membership that have gone through the disasters in 2017. The Venezuelan foreign minister said it was Hugo Chavez who first tried to build closer relations with the Caribbean. Especially since Commandante Hugo Chavez taught the Venezuelan people to turn to the Caribbean and to look towards our brothers and sisters. And specifically with Trinidad and Tobago, we have developed links which are mutually beneficial, which we are able to see right here. We spoke about many things and still needed to cover more topics, for example trade, how we make the most of what is being produced in states such as Sucre and Delta Amacuro, the eastern region of Venezuela, to what is being produced in Trinidad and Tobago, and vice versa. In his Independence Day message to the nation, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, spoke to his countrymen and women about entrepreneur, entrepreneurial socialism. Brown says in its 36th year of independence, the country needs to adopt in an economic model that combines socialism and capitalism for a new model of governance and public-private sector partnership. He says in the coming weeks, he will release a document that clearly in illustrates his plan he did, however, take time to address criticisms of his new policy. Detractors of this proposal, particularly one non-national business enterprise, has maliciously described it as, and I quote, anti-private sector, end of quote. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I should set down a marker on this, our 36th, anniversary of independence that private sector investment both local and foreign is both welcome and encouraged what is not welcome and will never be encouraged are slick and rootless business practices that deprive the people of Antigua and Barbuda of their just earnings exploits workers ignores the rights of nationals and misappropriates revenues properly due to the nation's treasury. More news in a minute. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Now for the special of our special series on Chile's Mapuche people. We're crossing into their territories, but this time we're showing you the shocking contrast between the land still protected by the communities and the businesses of the multinational logging companies that's laying bare the rich natural environment in the far south of the continent. Here's our special report from our team of Paola Dragnich and Juan Pablo Arianella. To the naked eye, this green landscape can be misleading. It looks like a natural forest, but it isn't. These are thousands of hectares of industrial plantations of pine and eucalyptus, genetically controlled and harvested systematically, mainly to produce cellulose. The ecosystem is no more. Natural water sources, life itself, cannot develop in this arid and acid soil. Before, there were Mapuche communities living here. The communities always lived around these hills. These hills were their point of reference. In the traditional vision we have between man and nature and everything this relationship provides. From balance and biodiversity to Lithrophilmonian, Machokinun and everything we Mapuche know as the forms of life and the conception of man and the world. The Mapuche's demand to recover the land is not a whim. There are still some protected spaces that survive as a result of their resistance. Areas where the water, the hills, and the ancient Araucaria trees express this Mapuche philosophy, in which the identity and territory cannot be separated. We are Mapuche, it's people from the land, people who are in direct connection with the territory. That's why it's our responsibility to recover our land, so this territory can live again. The government of Salvador Allende promoted a reform to give them back their lands. But during the Pinochet dictatorship and the democratic governments that followed, the Mapuche were left with crumbs and their lands were given away to companies. Our territory has been devastated by capitalism and multinational companies because the Chilean state has given these lands to foreign people for them to fill their pockets with money, while our people are still living in poverty, squeezed into tiny communities. That's why we, as Mapuche youth, have the responsibility to take up this fight again. The logging companies dominate over 3 million hectares, today owned by Winca families, as they call the white settlers in the Mapudungun language. All this thanks to the millions of dollars in subsidies from the Chilean state and to the police who protect these businesses repressing the Mapuches' attempts to recover their land resources and autonomy. The Mapuche also reject their assistentialism of what they call forced inclusion by the state. These communities live basically from agriculture, animal husbandry, and also what we call productive reappropriation. The state calls this a crime. They say we are stealing wood. We say we are taking back the raw material located on the land that was stolen from us. And. According to them, they're willing to recover whatever they can, however they can. More than 10 people have been injured and 60 detained by the police during the Colombian national strike. Attacks and threats against social leaders are some of the allegations being made by the group called the Agricultural National Table. In Bogota, leaders of the strike gave an account of the protest action. It's systematic, the murder of social leaders in the country. There aren't any guarantees for social movements, and it would be very serious if the situation repeated in any place of Colombia where social leaders are being captured. What we really need is to catch those who are murdering our social leaders. We hope that during these weeks and after the government's negative response, that mobilizations around the country will rise, and especially in departments where the organization has a presence. And in Colombia, the FARC, now a political party, has announced its candidates for the 2018 presidential elections. This morning, the FARC's new political party formally announced they will present a candidate for the presidential elections of 2018. The candidate will be Rodrigo Londoño, who was the leader of the guerrilla movement and today represents FARC's new political party. He will run with Imelda Daza, the representative of the Voices 
of peace movement and a survivor of the political genocide that happened in Colombia against the leftist party Patriotic Union. They also announced who will lead the FARC's slate for Congress. For the Senate, the candidate will be Ivan Márquez and for the House of Representatives, Jesús Santrich. Their announcement also touched on concerns they have regarding the obstacles the political party is facing from those opposed to the peace process in the Congress. There was due to be a debate on this yesterday, but it was postponed. This afternoon, the Congress called for a new session on the peace process. The FARC expressed its concern over the murder of FARC members in different parts of Colombia. Just yesterday, a former fighter was killed in Nariño department and another was badly hurt. The list adds up to 28 FARC members killed in 2017. We shouldn't forget that today the National Minga went into its third day. The communities announced that the three villagers were hurt during police repression. The indigenous communities are demanding that the government respects peaceful protests. Lorena Hoyo is reporting there from Bogota. The Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, has announced a further increase in the minimum wage and pensions. This as nominations are closing for Venezuela's municipal elections. The president of Venezuela's Electoral Council, Tibisay Lucena, said 18 of the 22 political parties registered in Venezuela have put forward candidates for the elections in December. Until now, 4,800 candidates have registered online. From this group, 4,016 are men and 784 are women. Only 18 nominations have been registered at the municipal councils so far. And our correspondent Reagan Devines joins us live from Caracas. Hello Reagan. It seems that President Maduro has raised the minimum wage. How has that been received in Venezuela? Yeah, we're getting mixed reviews right now as just about half an hour ago, President Nicolas Maduro announced a 30% increase in not just the minimum wage, but also the SESTA ticket, which is um, um, an additional sum of money that residents and workers receive, rather, that will help them uh, to purchase food and services, etc. So it all moves up to 456,507 um, bolivares per month, and this will go into effect from tomorrow. He said that from tomorrow, persons will be getting um, deposits into their accounts. So that will reflect the state percent increase. But mixed reviews we're getting. We're seeing this as this is not going to do anything because the price of, of food is constantly rising. Some say that this is just um, a strategic move by the president to cement his following uh, ahead of the municipal elections. However, this, this administration has been working throughout the year in terms of fighting speculation, in terms of helping citizens cope with the rising price of food, with rising inflation, as uh, the side they continue to work on um, trying to combat this, 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 this inflation rate that is completely out of control, one of the highest in the world. Now, just recently, um, Maduro said that they'll be coming, uh, hitting hard, coming down hard on those who take part in speculation. Over the weekend, on um, October 30th, I believe it was, um, 23,000 tons of food were found to have been um, hoarded in a warehouse somewhere in, a, in the state of Carabobo. And it was believed that it would have been used by bachaqueros to be resold on the streets of Venezuela at inflated cost. Now, remember, the, the government of Nicolas Maduro provides... Um, uh, food at a much discounted rate. Um, persons who um, go to certain outlets, certain supermarkets can enjoy these discounted prices. However, there were issues in the past where persons were found to have been hoarding food, um, creating this, this, um, this shortage of, of much needed items and then reselling them out onto the streets at much higher rates. And this is something that the government is trying to work hard against. Now, it's a big order. There are a lot of people everywhere on the streets selling foods, uh, rice, sugar, um, corn flour, basic items, milk, at much inflated prices. So there's a lot that is going on. And of course, there's the issue of, um, of a lack of control over persons who are in the administration that are assisting these bachiqueros on the streets. But as they fight this system that they, they are hoping to overcome soon or in the future, in the near future, they have raised the minimum wage to help uh, workers 
cope with this um, with this with this economic war that Venezuela is facing, Sony. Thank you so much for that update, Regan Devines. That's our um, correspondent, Regan Devines, in Caracas, Venezuela. The political differences within Ecuador's ruling party, the Pais Alliance, reached a breaking point on Tuesday night when the leadership said it was removing the country's president, Lenin Moreno, as president of the party. The executive secretary of Pais Alliance, Gabriela Rivandera, said Moreno had favored groups and individuals who are opposed to Ecuador's citizen revolution launched by the former president, Rafael Correa, a decade ago. She also said the president had failed to turn up to party meetings for three months. According to the absence record presented at the national office, it is confirmed that the president of the Alianza País party has a record of constant and unjustified absences to the national board sessions. In that sense, it is the board's duty to fulfill what is written in the party's set of rules, which establishes the destitution of the president. Now, immediately after that announcement, other leading figures from the Pais Alliance went on television to defend him and insist that he remain the leader of the movement. In several regional directorates, where the majority have proclaimed their full support, not only to the national government, everyone's government, Alianza Pais government, but their president, the president of all Ecuadorian citizens, the president of Alianza Pais, who is Lenin Moreno Garcés. We have also witnessed how more than half of the 44 assembly members have joined us in our indisputable support for the work of the president, the actions to reach a national dialogue, and particularly to carry out the referendum. Ecuador's indigenous groups will no longer have to cough up $1 million in legal fees that Chevron, the oil giant, had tried to claim from them. The Canadian court dismissed Chevron's claim to the legal fees, saying it was an attempt to block the case. The decision marks an important victory for the indigenous people in the region, as they can now continue with their five-year fight where they are seeking $9.5 billion for decades-long damage caused to their ancestral lands and trauma caused to the inhabitants. Women in Honduras are asking their presidential candidates to work on inclusive plans that bring solutions to the 65% of women who are the heads of their households. Most of those women are unemployed and many of them face violence. 52% of the population in Honduras are women. According to the Statistics Institute, poverty mostly affects this social group. The situation is getting worse, as well as the laws that are benefiting just one sector that corresponds to wealthy women. But the most vulnerable sector, the poor women, are not benefiting from these laws. Regarding the youth, the wives of the candidates affirmed that the violence and poverty is a direct consequence of the lack of interest from the state. Apart from bureaucracy, it's important to take action regarding the children that don't have a father, but only a mother who supports them and guides them through life. They can become criminals or prostitutes. Let's do something for them. Indigenous leaders affirm that their communities have never been in the government agenda and because of that, their women are suffering. The indigenous women traditionally work the land, but they are not a priority. Most of them work in agriculture, but they do not own the land. It's necessary that we work to create a new program regarding the agrarian law. Until now, just a few candidates have spoken about the issues that women and the youth face. The opposition is working on a plan that takes into account this group's demands. We are restoring their status as we give women the importance that they should have in the National Institute for Women. We are going to fight discrimination and lower wages for women. In Congress, only 25% of representatives are women. According to the National Institute of Statistics, unemployment hits women in Honduras at a rate of 10%. They are also victims of forced displacements and femicide. More news in a minute. Stay with us.
After 10 years of internal division, the people of Palestine have hope after Hamas handed over border crossings in Gaza to the Palestinian Authority. Our correspondent Noor Harazin filed this report. Today is a very significant day for the Palestinian people, not only because it marks the 100th anniversary of Belfort Declaration, where um, uh, Britain granted uh, Israel a land uh, to stay, but also because uh, today, apparently, Palestinian people have been granted hope after the PA uh, took control of uh, Gaza crossings. They took control of Rafah border, Erez crossing, and also Karm uh, Shalom crossing after 10 years of Palestinian division where uh, Hamas personnel were taking control of these uh, borders. This comes after a conciliation deal that was um, signed between Hamas and the PA uh, almost a month ago, ending 10 years of Palestinian division between the two rival Palestinian parties, Hamas and Fatah. No Harazin with that report. New details on the terrorist attack that took place in New York have emerged. Eight people, including five from Argentina, were killed when a man drove a truck along a bike lane in Lower Manhattan. The suspect was shot, shot by the police and arrested moments after the rampage. Local media said he left a note saying that he carried out the attack in the name of the Islamic State group. U.S. President Donald Trump tweeted that he had ordered Homeland Security officials to step up the extreme vetting program and criticize the U.S. visa system. And we have this special report on that very story. We are just in front of the Capitol where a protest is taking place organized by Democrat senators and congressmen with the support of a number of organizations. They are protesting against the fiscal reform pushed by U.S. President Donald Trump and the Republican Party. The richest group in the country would be beneficiating from this fiscal reform, a figure that can reach more than $3,000 million, according to the Center of American Progress. If the law is approved, the fiscal revenue would decrease dramatically, affecting social programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Hundreds of people at the Capitol said they will continue to protest to block this new law President Donald Trump wants to approve before Christmas. So actually, that was Francesca Emanuel. U.S. President Donald Trump is trying to pass a new tax reform, um, but Democrats, representatives, and social movements are protesting against that particular law. That's what that story about. But now, here are some other stories making headlines around the world. Power-sharing talks in Northern Ireland have collapsed after Sinn Féin and the DOP failed to reach an agreement. According to Sinn Féin, the difficulties in reaching a deal were compounded by the agreement the DOP made with Theresa May to prop up her government after the recent snap elections. As a result, the British government will begin the process of directly imposing an annual budget for Northern Ireland for the first time in a decade. British Prime Minister Theresa May says that action would be taken when there are allegations and evidence of sexual misconduct in Parliament. This comes after May's deputy, Damien Green, faces an allegation that he made an inappropriate sexual advance on a young woman. Allegations have also been made against other ministers and senior politicians. I hope we will all send a message from this House today that we want people in this place to be able to feel confident to bring forward cases and we need to ensure we need to ensure that those cases no we need to ensure that those cases are dealt with in a way that people can have confidence on both sides that they will be properly investigated that means and i want to see a good process within this parliament so that people feel they do not have to go to a party political process in order to have their allegations considered. This state of emergency has ended in France after two years. This comes after a new anti-terrorism law came into effect that gives police extended powers to search properties, conduct electronic eavesdropping and shut mosques or other locations suspected of preaching hatred. The Prime Minister assured citizens that they will still be protected. I know that now that the state of emergency has come to an end and that we are no longer in a context marked by the state of emergency, that some of our fellow citizens fear the intensity of our efforts in terms of security could drop. It is quite the opposite. The French people will continue to, to see policemen 
gendarmes in the street and soldiers part of the sentinel operation, which will continue. Groups of refugees, mainly Syrian women and children, stranded in Greek camps, pitched tents outside the country's parliament to protect against delays in being reunited with relatives in Germany. Some of the demonstrators say they were starting a hunger strike. The refugees say they have been waiting for up to a year or more, despite receiving assurances from the Greek government. State prosecutors will argue on Friday that Oscar Pistorius' six-year jail term for murdering his girlfriend is too short and should be extended. At trial, the prosecuting lawyer had sought a sentence of at least 15 years for the former champion athlete who killed his girlfriend Reva Steenkamp on Valentine's Day 2013. We've come to the end of this evening's news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I am Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching. has now reached over 1,000 in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria.